Cornwall. Behind one of the wildest and most romantic coastlines in Britain lies Bodmin Moor. Barren, windswept, and dominated by huge, craggy tors. Weird granite outcrops that have been sculpted by millions of years of harsh Cornish weather. This is a landscape that's been witness to thousands of years of human history. A recent archaeological survey recorded hundreds of prehistoric settlements here. But no one can say for sure how old they are, or even if they're all the same age. Do we have any idea how many people would have lived here during the Bronze Age? Yeah? When we carried out the survey, we recorded at least 200 settlements and 1,500 individual houses within those settlements. But what we can say with certain is there were at least a couple of hundred people up here at any one point, maybe even a couple of thousand. Is this a doorway? It is, yeah. It is eerie, the idea of going into somewhere that's maybe 5,000 years old. What exactly are we going to do here, Francis? We're going to do an excavation, dig a hole, and find evidence that will suggest, yes, this was a house, or no, it was used for livestock, and we'll also date the thing. I mean, we don't actually know that all of these are roundhouses. I mean, some of them could be stock pens, they could be clearance cairns. If we can identify areas of burning, that may indicate hearths, and so help with the interpretation. Then we've got the whole landscape beyond. But no one's been able to accurately date the whole settlement. Some structures on the moor could be thousands of years older still because 500 metres away to the northeast is another huge man made feature. We suspect it's Neolithic, and if it is, we're talking at least 2,000 years before the Bronze Age. But our local experts think that the first settlers here were drawn towards Row or Rao Tor. They'd have been in awe of these rocky outcrops, and there's evidence that they were worshipping here. Here at um, Rautor, we've got the hilltop enclosure, um, which we know um, was probably Neolithic in date, with other examples elsewhere on Bodmin. And these are almost certainly some kind of tribal gatherings, uh, centres for ritual ceremonies, a meeting place for people to come together and sort of celebrate their lives within the landscape. I think it's one of those sites where what's below ground actually might not be as informative as actually what's above ground. There's the stone sizes, there's the shape and size of, of these banks or cairns, whatever they are. We can look at how they're constructed, what they line up within the landscape. So this is a classic case. We've got to start looking at the obvious and try to understand what it's telling us. Hello. Yo. In Phil's trench, he's beginning to suspect this bank is far from being a random pile of stones. And what I'm noticing too, this is bang on line with the edge of the cairn. There's a load of upstanding stone. They just stick up out of the ground. Oh, yeah. And they go right the way through here. I reckon this is going to prove to be the edge of the cairn. The build-up and the makeup of it is going to be over that side and on that side is the collapse where it's fell out. Tumble up. And I've got exactly the same thing on my side. The light here on Rotor would have been as dramatic to the ancients as it is to us today. They worshipped the sun and ran their lives by it. And thinking about it, so do we. Despite the impetuous weather, it's been a good first day in our two house circles. The diggers have finally got into their stride. Over at the Cairn, they're now looking at stones that haven't been seen for thousands of years. And look at this. We're now deeper than the antiquarians got down to, and this surface too is maybe 5,000 years old. And tomorrow we're going to dig into it to see whether this was a place where people lived, or maybe where they buried their dead. I think you can vaguely see across here where it used to be and there's fewer stones, but um, mm. we, we've gone out beyond that, and you can see here all, all these, these collapsed stones here, which just go over the wall of the house there. There's masses of them. It's huge. I'm, in fact, I think there might be even too many for a wall there. <laughs> yeah. And we have had a, few, um, a, a couple of finds as well. There you go, a little thumb scraper. Oh, wow, look at that. And it's been burnt. Yeah, it's burnt flint, and it was found outside the walls just over there. Oh, that's interesting, because the two scrapers that were found by Dorothy Dudley's team were also outside. Look, there are these dots oh. there, just outside the entrance. And have you seen anything that might be a target for carbon dating? Possibly. You see 
the, the, the layer that we've come down onto there. Yeah, it's all quite nice, black. Nice dark black, and in the very centre of it, there mm -hmm. is in fact a, a quite a strong concentration of charcoal. I, I think we, if we put a, a slot across the back or something, and got a section down there and got a good sample of it, yeah. we probably could get something. At last, we're getting to grips with these stone circles. We've got trenches open in two separate buildings, and it would be fantastic if they were both part of the same potential Bronze Age village. But without doubt, the biggest mystery on the site is Phil's Neolithic cairn, built 6,000 years ago by the earliest farmers who only had stone tools. This monumental structure is over 500 metres long, and Francis believes it's no coincidence that it points east and towards the Tor. He's also convinced that it's unique in Britain, with only one or two other Neolithic monuments even remotely like it. When we were up here yesterday in the pouring rain, it looked to me like a rather random jumble of stones that you might put up to stop sheep wandering about. <laughs> but looking at it now, it looks like a really big structure. Well, the thing is, Tony, about these really big structures, they're very carefully put together, or the whole thing collapses. So I'm hoping that Phil has got good evidence for how the thing was actually built. I mean, you can actually see it on the surface, Tony. I mean, if you look up the monument, you can see that there are actually two parallel rows of stones running right the way up its length. And we've actually got some evidence of it in the trench here. Look. There's that big boulder which is sticking up through the surface of the grass. And we've got these big boulders coming down here. And actually, the infill is much smaller boulders. And if you really want to see the other side much more clearly, look at that whacking great stone in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what you've got are these, these two parallel, they're, they're like walls. So do you think the original shape would have been like a gentle slope and then a flat top? Yes, I think it is. I think it's definitely got a real definite shape to it. What about the buried soil? Well, we're just beginning to get a point where I think we've got it at the top is this sort of browny grey stuff. But the important bit is this very black stuff. Now that black stuff is the buried soil. But the important thing is that it's underneath this stone here. OK, we've got something that looks like a wall, but how do we know it's prehistoric? Why couldn't it be from any period? Well, it's the formality of that facing which is very, very striking. It's been deliberately placed there, and I think placed there to be seen from either side. And this is exactly what you get around the huge Neolithic burial mounds, the chambered tombs of Orkney and Ireland and all over the place. And that is very much a Neolithic feature, or even an earlier Bronze Age feature. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about it, because I think that's as diagnostic as anything else uh, we've found today. Absolutely. It would have been a heck of a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the whole point of these huge monuments is to bring families and people together from a, from a large area of countryside. So uh, the big monument represents a whole series of, of, of gatherings of the tribes. It's job creation, it's keeping the unemployment figures <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> to think that people were designing and building structures like this up to 6,000 years ago is mind boggling. I was looking in the top sort of over the other side of the trench, and I've come across this, this bit of green glass and uh, this piece of um, vessel rib. Oh, right. It looks a bit suspicious to me for the prehistoric or post-medieval period. <laughs> um, well, this is going to throw a cat in among the pigeons, because this is Roman glass. <laughs> it's the rim and then the shoulder mm. with a little piece of wild tra white trail slip along the bottom. Oh, I see. It is a little bit lighter just there. That's... Well, it's very rare for Cornwall, and I'd say it's about 2nd or 3rd century AD, which is a great surprise. I got to admit, I hadn't expected to find Roman glass out here in the middle of Bodmin Moor. The first really juicy find from these house circles, and it's definitely not Bronze Age. But it does suggest that Roman tourists or pilgrims might have come up here to visit these ancient ruins, anything from 1,000 to 3,000 years after the buildings went out of use. You'll have to see turf by hand because... Raksha's now opening our third trench in the house circles. Go for it! <laughs> this is the first structure we've dug that hasn't been excavated before, and we've got great hopes for the finds here. 
Over at Phil's Trench, the Neolithic bank cairn is proving to be a far more complex structure than we could ever have expected. So rather than going for a second trench, Phil's decided to concentrate all his efforts on deciphering this cross-section of the monument. In World War II, the army drove tanks straight through this bank. And although this desecration hacks Phil off, there's a big plus. Yeah, it's a veritable arsenal look. <laughs> They've been used. That one's got a clearly dented end. Yeah, we don't know what that blue hard. one is. Really <laughs> explosive. Just... But then, of course, we found this this morning. Look, these barbed wire, and that's in amongst yeah. the stones. And that's a consistent thing. It's yeah. all in amongst it. All loose, amongst rubbly stones. Loose, voidy stones. Yeah. yeah. These World War II finds confirm that some of the loose stones on the sides weren't part of the original Neolithic structure and must have been redeposited when the tanks breached the cairn. That one's a really interesting one, actually. In the lab, we're adding to our picture of the landscape as it looked when it was first farmed. They're dung beetles. Where'd you get them? We got them from the section where we were doing the processing in the stream. And what do they tell us? Um, they actually tell us about the environment. They're telling us that there were animals uh, grazing in the area uh, when the deposit was formed. How can you work that out? because there was lots of dung, and that's what they were interested in. OK, this tells us there was animal dung here, but can you work out which animals the dung came from? You can sometimes, yes. Um, they tend to be associated with large herbivores, such as cows, um, sheep, goat, and pigs and horses and things like that. So, yeah, they can be quite useful. Is it true you sometimes dream about beetles? It is, Tony, yes. What kind of dreams? Um, I had a nightmare about one last, one last night. This is a big one? <laughs> it was a very big one. <laughs> <clears throat> Emma's dung beetles confirm that livestock such as cows and sheep have been grazing these uplands for at least 5,000 years. And we may also be getting closer to knowing when early farmers occupied these houses. We're still digging all three stone circles. Last night we discovered a hearth in Trench 1, and Ian's digging through that very carefully and is coming up with material that the people who lived here might have thrown in the fire. There you go. It's a broken piece of flint. Very nice. In Trench 2, Bridge is struggling with her first find of the day. But it's not delicate archaeology she's dealing with. Oh, oh sorry, that was really tricky. <laughs> um, the frog's bite. In Trench 3, Ratcher's nearly ready to lift some of the stones. This is the one house circle that hasn't been dug before, and underneath we should have intact Bronze Age archaeology. We've also found a scatter of stones in all three of our house circles. And Francis is sure it's not a coincidence. This is a house. I mean, little doubt about that because there's a hearth there. But... <laughs> You look in front of you here, there's a large heap of rocks, and that heap of rocks looks for all the world like a cairn, and cairns are normally burial mounds. It's a bit strange turning your house into a burial, isn't it? And it is possible, of course, that there is a burial here, a dead person beneath that cairn, but it's also possible that it's a cairn to the house, to the life in the house. What do you mean by that? Well, it's very difficult to leave a home, isn't it? Especially if you've enjoyed living in that home, if you've enjoyed being on right, or you're leaving it forever, you turn the house into a cairn, turn it into a monument. Oh, it is a lovely idea, that, isn't there? Is there any way we can test it? If we carefully unpick this cairn, we can see whether it, it comes after the house or, or late phase of the house. It could be that they make the house a monument, but they may also be burying artefacts of life. The artefacts they use, like pot and other things in the house, could be found underneath the cairn, decommissioned in the same way. That would be good. Ooh. It's just after lunch on our final day, and at last something's come up in Trench 3 that could focus this whole dig. It's a small sherd of pottery. And this could be the first piece of evidence that puts our house circle firmly into the Bronze Age. Carl, I'm so, so excited about this because this is the first piece of pottery we've had in this trench. Well, I think you've every right to be excited. Um, this is um, Bronze Age pottery. It's what we call Travisca ware here in Cornwall. It's 
dates from the Middle Bronze Age, so yes, this is a very exciting piece. And I've just noticed on the interior, if you look carefully, you can see the black area. Yeah. That's actually internal residue, and that's the last meal that was cooked in this pot. So we're, we're, we're thinking it's about 1500. Yeah, it's around about 1500 BC. It's odd that something that looks so insignificant can tell us so much. This piece of Cornish Travisca ware confirms this was a Bronze Age home. And what's more, we know they were cooking here three and a half thousand years ago. Back in the farmhouse, Ben and Emma are beginning to run tests on some floor surfaces from the house in Trench One and material from Phil's Cairn. Organic matter, such as discarded food or animal dung, rots down and leaves phosphates. Animal dung was commonly used as fuel in Bronze Age houses, and by running these tests, it could give us an indication of the level of human activity. Because, Well, obviously, sat around the fire, it's waste, rubbish being dropped onto the ground, and that's, that persists in the soil over, over the millennia, basically. Emma, what are your initial impressions? Um, basically, We've got the hearth sample that's gone very blue, very quickly, lots of phosphate, lots of activity. All the way through the, the centre of the house, we've got, you know, again, evidence of phosphate. And even outside of the door, and that's really gone quite blue, and that went quite fast, didn't yeah. it, Ben? Yeah. Again, we've got evidence of phosphate. On the lower line, there are three that have hardly any phosphate at all, and one with just a tinge. Where were they from? Phil's trench, from the bank cairn. Um, as you can see, we're not really getting much evidence for, for phosphate, high phosphate levels in those at all. So, you know, clear distinction between the different trenches in terms of the concentration of phosphates in the soils. This is the sort of science I can really identify with. These organic remains have been locked in the soil for thousands of years. The phosphates also tell us there was little human or animal activity near the cairn. It was possibly a place kept sacred to the memory of the ancestors. Back on the moor, real archaeology is catching up with the science. Bronze Age pottery seems to be coming up everywhere. In Trench 1, Matt's found some more near the hearth. For two and a half thousand year old pot, this is really special. It's got that decoration on it, hasn't it? Yeah, where the, where the cord's been the, pressed into it. Yes, it's Trevisca ware. It's exactly like what Carl was showing me earlier on. That's some time in the Bronze Age, isn't it, Francis? Yes, it is. It's in the Middle Bronze Age, to be precise, um, ah. between roughly 1500 BC and 1000 BC. Right. And this is another piece, oh. also of Trevisca ware, but I think slightly classier, that yeah. one, with the cord impressed. Uh, chevrons, zigzags. Absolutely. And that yeah. came from Rakshar's trench, along with another little right. bit in here. Now, the importance of that, of course, is that all of his pottery is identical. Mm. And that means that the three houses that we've dug out of all of these houses are all contemporary. And that means, I would guess, a penny to a quid. But all of the houses are part of a village. So we have ourselves a Middle Bronze Age village. That is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> This is the first time that anyone's been able to confirm that this is a Bronze Age village, which is a great achievement. And our environmental team can add to the story. There's no evidence in the pollen analysis that our Bronze Age farmers grew any crops up here. It seems they carried on clearing the trees for fuel, and over the centuries, the soil became too acidic to support anything else. It would seem that unwittingly, Generation after generation of Bronze Age people were responsible for changing the face of Bodmin Moor forever. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Welcome to Dartmoor, one of the richest and best mapped prehistoric landscapes in Britain. But not all of it has been investigated, and there's a very good reason for that. Because for the last 150 years, this has been at the bottom of the reservoirs that supply the people of Torquay with their drinking water. Fast forward to the present day, and the reservoir's looking pretty empty. 
because the local water company have decided to pull the plug and give us a unique opportunity to explore a lost world. This could be some of the best prehistoric archaeology in Britain. The only problem is, now we've got rid of the water, how are we going to cope with the mud? It really is very difficult. <laughs> Totterford Reservoir is in an out-of-the-way valley on the eastern edge of Dartmoor. It's an isolated spot, so just getting into the site is a huge logistical feat, needing all our manpower. The reservoir's been here since 1861, when an incredible 30 million gallons of water were flooded into the lower part of the valley. But a couple of years ago, when the water levels were low, a local out for a walk spotted some mysterious stones sticking out of the mud. He called Jane Marchand from the Dartmoor National Park Authority, who became the first to investigate this hidden site. Why hasn't anyone ever discovered them before? Well, because they've laid under Totterford Reservoir water since 1861, when the reservoir was created. And before that period, I don't think people were coming out looking at local archaeology. It's a bit early for sort of the explorations on Dartmoor, which began in about 1880. What would you like us to find? <sighs> oh, basically, to give some idea of the chronology of these monuments. So it's what, where, why, yeah. in three days in the mud. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Can you. Do it? Thank you so much. <laughs> We've already put in three trenches on what are hopefully three different prehistoric monuments that we suspect date from the Bronze Age. Trench one is over what we think is a terminal burial cairn at the end of a single row of stones. We've put in trench two on two piles of rocks that might be more burial cairns. And trench three is over a double row of stones that we suspect was a processional way leading up to a mound, which Francis thinks is the central part of the whole site. It's possible that the mound was here for thousands of years before these monuments were even built, as we've got dating evidence from flint found on top. If we're right, and it is this vast prehistoric ceremonial landscape, mm. what does it mean? What's it for? Well. What it was for was the different things in people's lives that they want made formal and ceremonial. So these cairns would be when someone passes on to the next world. Um, this double stone row could be a procession um, that marked when a new uh, chief came to, to power, something like that. Um, this stone circle was where people celebrated the changing of the seasons. So it's like a combination of a church and a registry office? And a town hall. Yeah. Yes, it, it's all there. Um, and the thing is, it all seems to fit together, Tony. It's almost too good to be true, isn't it? It is. And then of course, all these theories rely on the dates of these monuments tying together. Mind. Well, I mean, I think it looks like these stones here from this cairn are later than these ones here. Over in Trench 1, we've got major doubts about the terminal cairn being prehistoric, especially when you compare it with the single stone row. Is the cairn earlier or later than the stone row? And we should get it in that section? Absolutely. All right, fair enough. And it's not looking any better in Trench 2 either, as we're uncovering evidence that the cairns aren't prehistoric at all. We've removed the silt here. You can see this really fine, almost clay on top there. And that was the silt from the bottom of the reservoir. And it's sitting on top of this dark layer, which was the ground surface in 1860, when the reservoir was filled. And here's our cairn. And you can see that the stones of the cairn are sitting happily right on top of the 1860 ground surface. And that means, Rachel? Well, it means that it's not prehistoric. And we know that because it's literally just sat on top of that black surface. It's not cut into that, so there isn't a specific cut made for it. Does this mean that all the piles of stones around the reservoir are likely to be from the 1860s? Well, that one's 1860. This one here as well, it's in front of you, that's also clearly sitting on top of that old ground surface. The cairns that we have are coming in a line along the edge of the reservoir. They're all in a nice line. My bet is none of them are prehistoric. 
I seem to remember not long ago saying that this all seemed too good to be true. That hole, what, was a stone in there once? Yeah, I mean, that's a really nice rubber. It's been pulled out, presumably, when the um, reservoir's been done. Yeah, it looks about that level. Mm. So then over here, we've got another stone, the one that matched that. Mm. Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> I think we've got the... The hole, haven't we, for the for the stone? It looks like it. I mean, you can see that small rock standing down there. That's the classic wedging for mm. a stone in a stone row. And the other thing, of course, we got this stony stuff at the top mm. here. Do you think that could be the remains of a, of a sort of walkway? It's degraded down and it's covering the surface. So right. this must have been the point at which this was open to walk up and down on, I would have thought. I think that's brilliant. OK, I'm convinced, especially with that little packing stone there, that this is a prehistoric double stone row. Yeah. I mean, little doubt about it. So, Francis is very happy with his double stone row. But other parts of the site have got us scratching our heads. Could have easily been set up. OK. Which could have fallen over. We've got another massive monument to investigate, and Helen and Stuart are getting their heads round it, the stone that's, circle. They're looking much more into the centre, aren't they? That's right, yeah. Now, this is the one that's, that's vastly off the line. They're not sure that the stones are even in a circle. It's too late in the day to put in another trench, so the plan is to start digging tomorrow to try to prove the stones are prehistoric and form a circle. Have you got something going on over there? Back in Trench 1, Phil and Faye may just have found some conclusive evidence that dates the single stone row. There is, you know. There's a cut The good there. news is that, that is it's prehistoric. Cut. That is the hole that has got our long row of stones in. There's a cut in there. You can trace it right from where your trowel is. That's it. Yeah, there. Yep. Now, if you go on up with your trowel, up there, keep going. That's right. It got right the way through that light grey. Yep. So, what the sequence is, they've cut a hole. That's the line you've just scored. Yeah. Then they put the stones in. Then the whole lot is filled in with that dark grey stuff. That's it there. And then the whole thing is sealed off by that very, very dark top so that old ground surface this stuff we had earlier on this stuff all the way along here that's right and then the cairn goes on the top of that that is our sequence so basically we were right absolutely the cairn is later than these we still don't know why this row of single stones is here so could francis's idea of a ritual landscape be falling apart there's certainly a prehistoric site here but rather more of it, I think, relates to that reservoir building. I think some of the other mounds do. Some of these lines out here, I suspect, are probably field boundaries from that period as well. So what are we going to do tomorrow? Well, if you look on the geophysics, you'll see that the mound we're on is this noisy oval area here. That's where Phil found the flints this morning. And so we're going to do some sampling on that, see if we can get more evidence, aren't we? Yeah. So test pits, which we'll sieve here, and then I want to go down there to the, the sort of focus of the whole site, this stone circle. But just to be honest, I'm having serious doubts about it. Oh. We believe we've got a late Neolithic or Bronze Age double stone row that may have acted as a processional way leading to a central mound, which we think is thousands of years earlier. This is turning out to be a more complex site than we thought. That's the first one there. OK, Rakshaw, if you go in pit one, whatever we're calling it, I don't know what the numbers are, but let's call it pit one for the time being. To try and understand what's going on, the plan is to dig four small pits in 10-metre sections along the mound to see how much flint there is and to help us date the site. Do you and think the person we... who gets the most flint gets a glass of cheap white wine when we get back home, all right? Most flint! Get going! <laughs> if Francis is right about the site being ceremonial, there must have been something very special about this place that drew people here. What's thing that's really clear when you're in the bottom is that you feel enclosed. You feel like you're in a natural bowl or an amphitheatre. Stuart believes that the landscape is the key to the puzzle. So if you have a natural amphitheatre, it would make it quite an important place to be. But... Yes, all... is it natural or is it the exactly, result of having a exactly. reservoir there? I couldn't quite work out whether that was a natural barrier till I found this map. 
which is early 19th century, it's 1801, first edition uh, one-inch map. And it shows on here quite clearly the brook coming down the valley yes. and turns the right angle yes. and goes down there. So that barrier at the south is natural and would have effectively sealed that in. We have got an enclosed space in there. So I think a, a key part of the archaeology down here has to be to get Henry to do some sampling of the sediments across the valley there to try and understand what that environment would have been like, standing water, flowing water, all those sort of questions. It can be quite crucial in understanding that if it is a ceremonial complex. Stone doesn't mean it's part of a circle. Yeah. So what I'd like to see now would be the results of the geophysics and see if we get a better pattern. So a lot's riding on geophys to prove that the stones are in a circle. Thousands of years ago, the landscape looked very different to what it does today. This 3D model shows the landscape setting really well, doesn't it? It's, you know, the, the if we're going to understand what was going on here, we need to establish what the place looked like in prehistoric times. So Henry's been making a 3D model. Looking at the relationship of the stream as it comes around here, it's so close to the stone circle mm. that if the stream had moved, as they do, um, through time, it would have taken out part of the stone yeah, circle. So what I wonder, sticking my neck out, is whether here we've got another island, like this one, mm. but m more subtle mm. because the actual the sedimentation of the, of the lake has actually masked it. So after doing this bit, I want to start calling around this area and seeing whether there are other channels and other areas of possible wet deposits which might have made this into another island. I just Get on with it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> what else is the yes. same? <laughs> so Henry starts his core sampling to test his theory that the site was built on islands surrounded by water. It's, it's inorganic sediment, if you know what I mean, but it's, mm. it's got enough remains to make it brown. And over in Trench 1, Faye's found some evidence that supports this theory of water being an important feature in this prehistoric landscape. Right. Yeah. So I've got down here the cut for this linear stone, whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah. And on that side over there, we've actually got what appears in section is the bank of what I think, because of this sediment down here, a river. So we're right on the edge of the valley, in fact. Yeah. When you say a river, you mean one of the streams is coming through here at some stage. Yeah, exactly. And really interestingly, then we've got all these stones which seem to lie in it. Yeah. So they, they're contemporary with this river. And the key question, of course, what date? It's a very difficult question. No, we haven't got dating evidence, but with the amount of stratigraphy and the amount of all these layers, these sediments, I yeah. think we're talking about the prehistoric period. Right, right. With the single stone row deemed prehistoric, another piece of the Bronze Age ceremonial landscape falls into place. But there's still one big part that hasn't been confirmed, the stone circle. If it is prehistoric, it'll be a first for time team, a good enough reason to celebrate. And another thing I haven't told you is that it's our 200th dig. So what better way to end the day than with some bubbling? Death to our enemy! Who would have thought? All these years we'd still be doing I, I didn't think we'd even get going to start with. <laughs> well, this is turning into a really exciting dig. We've got our Neolithic walkway along here. We've got our Mesolithic mound there. But over there, have we or have we not got a stone circle? Because if we have, it could prove to be the key to the whole site. We'll find out tomorrow. Cheers. Beginning of day three here at Tottiford Reservoir in Devon, and everyone's a bit muted today after last night's celebrations, which is a bit of a problem because we've got an enormous amount of work to do trying to establish whether or not what we've got here is a giant prehistoric stone circle. Francis, yesterday afternoon we put this trench in to try and establish whether this stone had been buried a long time ago or whether it was much more recent. Have we proved anything yet? Yes, Tony, and I am certainly not muted on this. This really is exciting. We've got 
the hole that the stone was placed in. Right, but more than that, we've got the stones that were put in there deliberately to wedge it to get it at precisely the right angle. So you wouldn't do that if you were just making a field boundary wall or something. So this has to be a Bronze Age stone. Now, whether it's part of a row or a circle, I don't know. I've seen some flints from around this stone. Those flints are definitely prehistoric. I am also convinced that that stone is prehistoric. But, of course, just because we've got one prehistoric stone doesn't mean we've got a prehistoric stone circle, does it? It just means we've got one prehistoric stone. Exactly, Tony. But, look, over there, you see that stone there standing on its own? Yeah. Well, Geophys discovered a stone hole next door to it. So if we put a trench between those two and they're both real and they're both prehistoric, then I think we've got ourselves a stone circle. Phil? You look rather like an Australian sheep shearer holding sheep droppings. <laughs> well, I'm over the moon, Tony. That is our prehistoric pot. You're joking. No, I'm not. Those tiny little pellets? Absolutely, absolutely. How do you know that? Well, I've had a word with, with Carl, our local pottery expert, and he's happy that that is Bronze Age pot. Where was it filled? It came from about 18 inches away from that stone. So, Henry, this is the sum total of the work that you've been doing over the last few days. Yeah, this is the survey and the borehole work and everything else we've got. The coring transects have been putting across here, just trying to understand the landscape and its environment. What we have are two streams from Francis's Bronze Age ceremonial landscape running through the valley, either side of the central mound, and an island on which the stone circle was built. As yet, we don't know how the stone circle links to the mound, but Raksha may just have found the answer in her trench. Raksha, what's this little depression here that you've been excavating? This depression here, believe it or not, is a post hole we found just after lunch. A post hole? Yep. For something wood? Yes, it's for a wooden post. How do you know that was for a wooden post and not for a stone? Well, if you look in Tracy's trench, she has a standing stone in it and there's actually a cut around it, so it would have gone much deeper. We're in the middle of a Bronze Age stone circle. Yeah. We've got a post hole, and these flints are all Mesolithic. So how long before the Bronze Age circle was here would that post have been here? About 4,000 years. Wow. And that's the same sort of date as the mound up there? Yeah. That's extraordinary. So 4,000 years after that post was put in, all these stones were erected. So you were right yesterday afternoon yeah. when you said if we could crack this circle, then we would understand more about the logic of this site. You've got something that's Mesolithic here, yeah. uh, and that's Mesolithic, isn't it, on that mound? Yeah. And then later you've got the walkway coming up to it, yeah. and then you've got the Bronze Age circle. Yes. So this site began when people were still hunter-gatherers, then it became farmers, and then it was an age of metal. Phew, at last. <laughs> That's a relief, isn't it? I know. This is an incredible find. We've uncovered some sort of Mesolithic timber structure as old as the flint work on the mound. So we're now able to link all the features together in our ceremonial site. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. The remains of the castles lie near Hamsterley, 20 miles southwest of Durham in the Weir Valley. Sitting on the side of a hill in a sheep farm, the site's a huge dry stone enclosure measuring approximately 70 by 90 metres. Now overgrown with trees, its crumbling walls still form a monumental structure. But even so, no one knows what it is or when it was built. Oh, Mick, have you seen this? Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Is it really a garden? It's guy very house? difficult to believe that this is all original, though, isn't yeah. it? Well, we have his photos. Right. And the photos do show these openings into this guard chamber. So it looks as if it is original. Yeah, I think it's got to be, but I think the only way we're going to prove it for sure would actually to be a, dig a hole on the other side, because when you get one guard chamber, you get a matching one on the other side. That's what I want to do next. What, where this uh, gorse bush is? Yeah, well, I think we've got to base it on this bit of wall here. Yeah. And just go back there. Tell you what, we can tell people where to put the trenches in. There's going to be a heck of a lot of stone shifting, there isn't is. there? <laughs> we'll just mark it up and slope off. Unmanly. <laughs> 
So we're putting in a trench on the eastern side by the entrance to the enclosure to see if there is another guardhouse. If we find one, it'll tell us if the existing chamber's original and give us an architectural clue to the castle's date and function. Now we're moving. Laying siege to the entrance, the archaeologists flex their muscles, beginning to shift the mountains of tumbled stone. Do you know what? They'd have had to have done this in reverse when they were building it. We're also putting in another trench across the north wall, hoping to learn more about its construction and locate the early ground surface and datable artefacts. Naomi, why have you brought me to this dark, dirty <laughs> hole here? On the other side of this uh, trench, we had one face of a wall, and we've discovered the other face. Oh, right, so this is the outer face. We had the inner face yesterday. That's right, yeah. So is this original, or is this a bit of Hodgkin's reconstruction? No, I think this is the uh, original wall, because I think if it was rebuilt uh, and reconstructed, it would be much straighter, yeah. uh, whereas this, as you can see, it's all starting to lean in and collapse slightly, I and mean, that's just a process of time, really. Here we are in an Iron Age enclosure. Where is the most likely place for the building to be? Now, if you look back through there, we are slap bang in line with the main entrance. In fact, we are slap bang in the middle of the enclosure, which is the most likely place for the high status building. Now, if we assume that, that anybody but Mr and Mrs Clean and Tidy was living here, you'd expect to find some traces that they lived here. But we know there was ploughing here. Couldn't it be ploughed out? Ah, this trench is placed on a ridge, so the archaeology is more likely to be preserved underneath it, and the furrows are on either side. As digging begins to uncover more about the castle's date and function, our wall survey has revealed how it was constructed. Peter, this site has proven to be a hell of a problem to date. In places we have original build, and then in other places we have Hodgkin's rebuild. Yep. Is there any difference? We know that Hodgkin's says that the lower few courses on this wall were original. This, with the smaller stones, thinner stones, this is Hodgkin's rebuild. I can't help but notice these steps. Are they to get up onto the top of the wall? Well, that was Hodgkin's belief, but um, I'm not convinced they are steps. If you look at them, there's not a scrap of wear on them anywhere. Now, if these had been used as steps, the edge would be quite rounded and worn, and there's not a sign of that. I think this is the result of this part of the wall falling um, in ancient times, maybe a couple of thousand years ago, leaving the ragged end here, which they've consolidated with big stones, and then they've rebuilt this slightly thinner. A lot cleaner now, isn't it? Well, it is. It's a lot cleaner, but as it's been cleaned up, we've seen that these stones are straight and form part of a rectangular building. Right. Right, right. so um, it's, it can't be Iron Age, I don't think, but at that end, it's cut by those furrows. So what date are they? 1780 was when this land was enclosed, so... Right, so a pre-18th century building, but, yeah. but, but not Roman or medieval, presumably. No. No, um, I think you're looking at something a little bit earlier than that, uh, earlier than the medieval. You have that cell thing over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be Dark Age. So are we really thinking this is a Dark Age building? Well, why it'd not? Be a wow if it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks as though any Iron Age roundhouse that might have been here has been ploughed away. And instead, we found a square, potentially Dark Age structure, which would have been contemporary with the Dark Age guardhouse at the entrance. When you come to a site like this and work on a project like this, there's all sorts of other things you can use. The, the comparative size and shape of the site itself. You look at its position in the landscape and see if that tells you anything. And we've done that and they've been very productive, haven't they? So we can say quite firmly, this is a late Iron Age enclosure. This is essentially a farmstead, a very elaborate one, but a farmstead probably of the late Iron Age period. Can we say any more than that? What we can say is we've got evidence for this site in Northumberland at South Hedden where there seems to be a largely pastoral economy mm -hmm. towards the end of the Iron Age, and that's quite important because we can then compare that with other sites where you find big enclosures but there's only a very small number of houses in them. What's all that other space used for? It seems to be because you need space to bring the animals in. They're your investment, that's, that's your power base, as it were, in this bit of landscape within which they live. So our three-day siege has brought us closer to untangling the age-old mystery of the castles. The enclosed farmstead was built in the Iron Age, 
its five metre thick stone walls would have stood three metres high and the eastern entrance was fronted by two massive stones flanking an impressive wooden gate. There would probably have been a large stone roundhouse positioned opposite the gate. Stone cattle enclosures were built in the shelter of the walls which would have protected the livestock. Later in the Dark Ages, the gate was modified and a substantial guard chamber added. The central roundhouse was replaced by a square building. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.